So uh, both Dr. Gobina and myself work for the Selikoff Center, which is the largest clinical center in the New York State Occupational Health Clinical Network. The um, New York State is the only state in the union that uh, funds an occupational health clinical network. We have uh, clinics. Uh, there, are about eight, there are eight clinics. They range from Western New York or down to New York City. Each of them really deals with a somewhat different population because, you know, we don't see a lot of um, agriculture, whereas the uh, Cooperstown Clinic sees a lot of agriculture. So uh, any worker, retiree, resident in New York can come to the clinic and nobody will be turned away for lack of funds. Next slide, please. Oh, the contact information Go back, is at the bottom of this slide. Anybody needs it, uh, this presentation will be available later on anyhow. Next slide, please. So lead is what we're here for. It's everywhere. It's in so many different products from ammunition to cosmetic products, coal, uh, electronics, crystal, obviously old paint. Uh, now there's a big emphasis on uh, lead pipes. We're spending billions of dollars to get rid of those pipes throughout the country. Uh, so it's, it's really everywhere and we keep running into it. Next slide, please. So how does the lead get into our bodies? There's really three major routes, Re respiratory, breathing it in. Um, that would be the smoke that you'd breathe in or the particles, may maybe ingestion, eating it, you know, to get into the digestive system. Um, thing important thing to know is that adults um, absorb about 6%, which whereas children um, almost up to 50% and more if they are malnourished. They are a more likely receptor if they are exposed. Skin really mostly is impervious to lead, lead paint, lead chips, organic lead, which we'll discuss a little bit later, tetraethyl, tetramethyl lead, that can go through the skin. But we're not, that's not your, not in, involved in your work and not, and the, it really have eliminated that. Um, of course, it's a possible route through open wounds. Next, Luke. So uh, lead-based paint. That was a lot of our exposure at one time. Um, it's still a lot of it around. Lead was added to paint because it's a good additive. It's durable. It um, kills mold. It stands up well to wear and weather. Uh, but we've known for a long time, going back to the Roman era, um, 100 AD, We've known about the toxic effects of lead. Ben Franklin talked about it. France banned its use as a house paint in all the way back in 18, 1909, New York City in 1960. And finally, in, in for the U.S., U.S. Co Consumer Product Safety Commission banned the sale of lead-based paint for residential use. Next slide, please. So a little background information. There is no medically accepted safe blood lead level. None. We're not built to have lead. We're not built to store lead. That is, but it is in the environment, and that's how we get exposed. Uh, overall, blood lead levels have decreased. Uh, in the 70s, blood lead levels in the U.S. Uh, for adults was a, around 15 micrograms per deciliter. We'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, now, currently, blood lead level is around one, mic one to maybe a little and a half micrograms of deciliter. Um, give you some idea of what will, levels we are considered safe. The couple of research, uh, scientifically based professional safety and health uh, organizations um, have issued some uh, guidance. So NIOSH, which is the research arm of OSHA, uh, considers a blood lead level of five to be elevated. Pregnant women are consistently uh, avoided, um, told not to exceed a level of five. The American College of Occupational and Environmental Medicine recommends lead workers should be tested, those at the people who are working with lead, to be tested every two months. And they suggest a medical removal 
uh, for any worker with a blood lead level at or greater than 20. In contrast to that, the OSHA standard was written to keep your blood lead levels below 40. And that was passed in 1978. Funny, not funny, but uh, um, really tragically, um, for construction workers, they didn't were not covered until 1993 when they an, a lead standard was issued for anybody in construction uh, working with lead. Up until that time, they could be exposed at a much higher level. Next slide, please. So uh, what had a, a great effect on overall blood lead levels was the Clean Air Act. Um, we had for the longest time since the 20s added lead to gas. That was to boost its efficiency. Uh, the Clean Air Act made the EPA uh, try to get rid of tailpipe emissions. So that would be carbon monoxide, nitrous oxide, sodium oxide, uh, the particulate matter. And to do this, they decided that cars would now have catalytic converters, which the thieves are now cutting out of everybody's vehicle. But in order for them to work, or in order for the catalytic converter to work, they had to eliminate lead because lead deactivates the um, the catalytic converter's efficiency and can lead to almost zero efficiency on removing the product, uh, any of those particles that we discussed. Next slide, please. So this slide was a really good uh, comparison. I, it shows you how effective with um, eliminating lead in gas was to um, to our average blood lead levels. You look in this, and so the red is the average blood lead levels for US adults, and blue is the decrease of lead in gas. And they really parallel each other and show you how effective. Now, this wasn't the EPA's plan. It's just what happened. Next, please. So the, the term you run into is permissible exposure level. That is uh, an OSHA term. It's for air, how much lead is in the air. You are not supposed to exceed this level. And that level is 15 micrograms a cubic meter. So what, what does this mean? A cubic meter was approximately a box 39 inches by 39 by 39 inches. So, um, you know, you got to imagine this air, this box of air. So one, a gram, uh, which is um, a, equivalent to a packet of sugar, you look on it and that's what I'll tell you, or a sugar substitute is a million micrograms or a thousand milligrams. So if you take, and this is for illustration, a gram divided up uh, or 15 times, and there's the math, you wind up with 61, which is as close as I could get to 50. Next slide, please. So this is a practical on the table demonstration that I do in class. And that on the left, you have the packet emptied. That's the full gram. And then that's nine divisions of the contents. You, if you see, you really, the six more divisions, it's impossible to do. That's the idea behind this is that is how little air, little lead in that 50 micrograms per cubic meter. Next slide, please. So this is another comparative slide, give you an idea what, when we're talking about these names, these things like microns and like that, the big round thing on the top is, um, represents a human hair, which ranges between 80 and 120 microns. If you go down to the next, to the bottom, that's 0.3 microns to one micron. And you'll, later on in this, talk, um, you'll see the significance of that number. But the idea here is to look at the difference, how small point of 0.3 micron or one micron is compared to a human hair. Really, we're looking at very, very small particle sizes. Next, please. So HEPA filters, which we, are, and that's in your air filters and your respirators, they have a very specific definition and a lot of people uh, don't 
or talk about them, but they're, they're not talking about them correctly. So what is a HEPA filter? It's a high efficiency particulate air filter. They're designed to remove particles that are 99.97% of, of point of size of 0 0.03. That's why we're talking about that number. It's really small number. And if you look at the chart, uh, the, the diagram below, you can see that, and I can, I guess you can, uh, can somebody uh, put a uh, cursor on, on that? But if you just look at it, you see where the dip is? That's at the 0 0.3 side. On the other sides of that, larger, smaller, the, it's very, much more efficient. The efficiency raises nearly to 100%. It, and that's why they are tested for this efficiency of at the 0 0.3 micron particle size. So what we're talking about is particles is because that for a, a several filtration reasons, which we don't have to go into is a little complex. The science is a little complex, but that's the hardest particle size to capture. Not the smallest, the hardest. Next slide, please. So one of the routes we discussed was breathing in particles. So if you breathe in the largest size particles, again, we'll talk about 100 microns, uh, and and um, and smaller. If you uh, could, somebody put the cursor on the big on the guy to the, yeah, we go right there. So in that upper region where your windpipe is, and like that, that will trap the high, the larger size particles. The smaller ones, way right down at the bottom there, if, if where the air sacs are, and where we, where the breathing act, uh, where air oxygen uh, is. Ex is uh goes through the cell wall and into your bloodstream these small particles can do the same thing and then once it gets into your into the blood but this um once it gets in it can go around your body so but it's the important thing to remember here is only the smallest four microns or smaller that are going to be able to go through this the barrier of the alveoli or the air sac. Next slide, please. So another term and, and something, talk about fit testing. Well, what is it? You're fit tested for a very specific make, model, and size. For instance, an, a 3M 1860 respirator. What that means is you're fit tested for that one, not that particular one, only for that particular one, but for every one of that model. In other words, if 3M, which they do, makes a, another model, a, a 3000. You're not fit tested for that one, even though they look identical. The fit testing is for a make, model, and size. The, uh, of course, the small, the filtering base piece respirators, the N95s, most of those are uni size. So you could take out that part of the fraction that really deals with elastomeric respirators. But like shirts, like every you know, shoes, it's there's a each one has a particular size and fit, and that's why you, when you're fit tested, you're fit tested for that one that's fitted to your face that fits fits you correctly. So you could do fit testing either quantitative or qualitatively. Um, so what does that mean? Qualitatively, yes or no, that respirator is filtering out at the at its design, the level that it's designed to. Which is which is ten microgram uh, a fit factor of ten. Quantitative, you're going to get a number. How well it's working. Do you need to know that? You know, it's nice to know that. Uh, but the qualitative is telling you yes, that respirator that is working correctly. It's providing the protection, the design protection level. A lot of people talk about a seal check, which is a good thing that you could do. You put your hands there. If, if you're using a, a last American, you breathe in, it comes in on your face, great. Uh, but it's not a fit test. It's not as rigorous as a fit test. You can pass that all day, all day long and then you get fit tested and it's not working correctly. It's a thing that you use as a field test or in other words, a substitute for fit testing. Next slide, please. So again, this more with, with respirator fit, you have the area that the respirator fits on your face, the round, red round spot is the area that has to be has to be clean. You have to be clean shaven. 
it's the the when we talk about fit, it's how well it fits your face and how good a seal it makes. And if you have facial hair, it's not going to seal properly. Next slide, please. So uh, I'm not going to really discuss this in in depth. Basically, during the pandemic, we had a lot of counterfeit respirators out there. Made a lot of the N95s. Um, all respirators used in the U.S. Uh, occupationally have to be NIOSH approved. You I, NIOSH um, set up a great website that you can look at the, uh, the discussing the counterfeits. The URL is at the bottom. Next slide, please. So this is what a respirator and the box as as well that it comes in has to have all these designations and model number, NIOSH designation, the um, the respirator um, code for the company. The, there's a series of, of uh, certifications that occur and you just have to look out for misspelling, wrong names, things like that. Because a lot of these respirators, like I said, during the pandemic, and I'm sure they're still out there, uh, came into the country and, and they're counterfeits and you don't know if they're really going to provide you with the protection that they are supposed to. One thing that you can know for the most part, ear loops are not acceptable. They So if they have over the ear loops, they are most, almost all on, I think there's one or two out there that um, were acceptable, but the vast majority are not certified respirators. Next. So wouldn't be an IH presentation without looking at the hierarchy of controls in this there's a, a way to weigh how effective um, the controls are, the way to reduce exposure. So if you look at it and people be surprised, respirators, PPE are at the bottom. And the reason for that is they are effective and they will reduce exposure, but it means that you have to, they have to be used correctly. They, you know, and you got to wear them all the time and you got to use them correctly. You can't have a beard. There are a lot of ways you can reduce or eliminate their effectiveness. We like, as industrial hygienists and health people, we would like to eliminate the exposure completely so you don't have to worry about it. You know, using um, a lead-free solder is going to eliminate uh, the ex your exposure to lead. Doesn't mean it's going to expose you, reduce exposure to other things. We're talking, in this case, only how to, re how to reduce exposure to lead. Or you're substituting a project or you're using great ventilation. Next slide, please. So uh, the best way to reduce exposure is at its source. Eliminate reduced lead disturbing activities such as, you know, using a grinder, sanding, hand sanding is a lot less um, of an exposure, but even that presents a level of exposure. Wetting down surfaces are possible. Keeping the work area clean. Don't you never use high pressure air to clean surfaces, machinery, or your clothing. Uh, use a HEPA vacuum, as we discussed. Don't eat, drink, smoke in work areas. Um, wash your hands with a designated lead cleaning. There, is, there are soaps that are lead cleaning, and, and you can look at NIOSH's um, for the names of the products. Have a, don't bring, you know, keep your work shoes and work clothing at, on the where, you, where you're working. Don't use those. Don't go out and drive your car around and, and spread the dust around the in, in in your home and or in your car. Uh, one thing that's uh, not dealing with lead, but it's, you know, we are discussing uh, soldering. Don't use flux containing rosin products. These products can be, are irritants. They can call, uh, cause occupational asthma or even exacerbate existing asthma conditions. Next, please. So how do you know you have lead? There are, uh, we've all seen them, lead check kits. Well, you just do it's a color metric, you wipe it and tells you that the slide. I mean, you could also bring uh, a sample to an accredited lab that's designed that has a lead accreditation, uh, and they could chip, you know, analyze a chip or whatever you bring in for its percentage of lead. Um, the EPA uh, has designed has tested a, a lot of these lead test kits, and they have two which they say work well the 3M and the D lead. You can go to that URL for more information on lead check kits. Next slide. 
So a, a good method for reducing exposure, as I mentioned, was ventilation. But you have to uh, think about it a bit. Uh, if you're using something like opening a window, natural ventilation, you got to make sure that the air is going in the proper direction. You don't want the air to be blowing from the window towards you. You want to make sure that, that the air is moving so it takes the it takes the lead or the dust away from you, not towards you. You can also use on the right. You see a little soldering gun with a um, it, it has an extracting uh, vacuum. Uh, local exhaust ventilation on it, as well as a soldering tip that sucks in the gas while you're soldering. Um, you can also use, uh, you can see in the little box, the uh, air extracting system with those um, trunks that you can put next to the um, where you're working. The th thing with those is the further away that is from your work, and people can, will do that. They'll, it's in the way, so they move it out of the way. You, the effectiveness is re reduced dramatically the more as you move it away. And it doesn't take much distance between the source and the extracting hood to reduce it to almost nil. So you have to keep that close. Um, there's a good you, good video on that. It's from an English health and safety organization. And they discuss all the variables that could go into using a ventilation or extraction system. Next. So um, this was some monitoring I had done um, in a in a um, stained glass work working workshop. People were uh, actually it was a friend of mine he asked me to come in and do some monitoring for him, and you know we found some exposure was low nine micrograms a cubic meter, but well below uh, the limits set by OSHA or anybody else. Um, but it did show um, exposure. Hard, it's impossible to know if it was the gas we were seeing or it was particles that we were capturing. We know there was lead. Next slide, please. So uh, a big expo uh, a pos potential exposure was we looked at the workstation and that level of 300 micrograms per square foot, that's how that it's measured, was high, it was 300, much higher than you would have or allowable in a break area, an eating area, um, but it was a work area, so there's no regular, and, and you know, you're working, so it will be high. Try to keep that, try to keep those numbers low, especially in the areas that you're eating and drinking. I think that's the last slide in this pack. Thank you, Dr. Govina. Okay, thank you, Norm. Uh, so my name is Dr. Globina, and I'm going to discuss the health effects of lead exposure. Um, next slide, please. So um, how are we exposed to lead? As Norm had mentioned, the majority of lead is inhaled or ingested. Uh, you're not likely to have exposure to lead through your skin. And then in rare instances, individuals may have uh, leaded foreign bodies embedded in them, and that can be a rare but potentially significant source of lead exposure. Um, I think there are two big points to keep in mind is that lead poisoning is a preventable disease. So the bottom, uh, so the most important thing is to try to eliminate lead exposure as much as possible. And that regardless of the route of exposure, the health effects of lead are the same. Next slide. Okay, and as Norm had mentioned already, there's no safe blood lead level. Um, there are certain individuals that are at increased risk of having adverse effects on their health uh, from even low blood lead levels. And those are uh, children, undernourished individuals, older adults, um, smokers and alcohol users, as well as pregnant women and their fetuses. Uh, so what happens when lead enters the body? Uh, some of it is excreted, some of it is absorbed. And after it is distributed throughout the body by blood, it, is then, uh, uh, it then goes into the soft tissues, uh, which is our organs, and then ultimately majority of it ends up stored in the bones and teeth. 
And adults uh, store uh, significantly more of their absorbed lead in, the, in their skeleton uh, than children do. And unfortunately, lead, uh, once it's absorbed, can have uh, effects on the health uh, affecting multiple organ systems. So for example, uh, you, an individual can experience um, immune system disruption, uh, lead adversely affects fertility, uh, neurological and developmental delays can be observed. And uh, for, the, for the brain, uh, lead can have, especially at very high levels, uh, very severe consequences such as seizure, coma, and lead to death. Um, an individual with uh, high lead levels may experience abdominal pain and colic as well as constipation. Uh, lead affects our kidneys and can lead to kidney failure, especially at higher doses and uh, chronic exposure. And uh, lead uh, that is absorbed in uh, the skeleton affects bone density, but also via its effect on the kidneys, it interferes with uh, serum vitamin D levels. Uh, there's an association of blood lead levels and high blood pressure. And because lead has an adverse effect on the production of red blood cells, it can cause anemia. Next slide. So, um, I'm going to discuss various health effects and how do they correlate to the blood lead levels. But it is important to remember that there is uh, individual susceptibility uh, that plays a role. And in particular, individuals who are undergoing physiological stress, such as illness or at the extremes of age, um, or malnourished people. So um, at the what is considered the lowest blood lead levels of less than 10 micrograms per deciliter, uh, the most commonly health effects that are seen are neurodevelopmental, especially in children. Next slide. At low uh, or what is considered low blood lead levels, uh, you again see psychiatric or neuro, neurodevelopmental health effects, um, but in addition to it, it can lead to muscle pain, uh, abnormal sensations, abdominal discomfort, and fatigue. Next slide. And at what is considered moderate blood lead levels, uh, which is significantly lower uh, in children than it is in adults, uh, one can start to experience uh, musculoskeletal effects of uh, joint pain and muscle fatigue. Also, uh, neurological health effects as previously, um, and then abdominal uh, stress, distress, uh, including constipation, vomiting, pain, and um, weight loss. At higher, uh, uh, highest exposure levels where the blood lead reaches 70 micrograms per deciliter in children and 100 micrograms per deciliter in adults, uh, you see really severe profound effects of lead um, on the health of an individual. So somebody can come in with um, colic, which is a name for severe abdominal cramps that come and go. And um, somebody can experience paralysis and uh, perhaps most concerningly, uh, lead uh, encephalopathy can set in uh, leading to seizure, a loss of consciousness and potentially death. So Tony kindly, as we were preparing for this presentation had sent us information and some of uh, questions that uh, are common in the community and also uh, some of the myths um, that we will try to either confirm or dispel. So one of the things that was asked was what was the relationship between blood lead levels and lead deposited in the bones? And that's a very insightful question uh, because the uh, blood lead levels reflect both ongoing exposure as well as lead stores in the bone. 
and uh, because uh, some of the lead leaches out of the bone gradually into the blood. And so uh, the bone uh, contains about 90% of the total body lead burden in adults. It was lower in children, if you recall. And a proportion of lead um, in the blood comes from the bone itself. Uh, so even in the absence of ongoing lead exposure, somebody can have elevated blood lead levels, especially um, under in the circumstances where there is an increase in bone resorption. And these are, again, as I mentioned, physiologically stressful um, times such as pregnancy, lactation, uh, osteoporosis, uh, menopause, uh, something that comes with severe weight loss and uh, certain illnesses. Uh, so how do we test for lead and what do these tests mean? Uh, the most commonly used test is a blood lead level that is measured in venous blood. And that reflects your recent as well as current exposure. And so some of the advantages of this test are the fact that blood lead levels are, um, uh, have a linear relationship to the amount of lead that has been absorbed. And in other words, that the more lead uh, exposure one has, uh, uh, the greater the blood lead levels will be. So it's easy to interpret. And also, uh, it can react rapidly to intermittent um, uh, exposure to lead. So if you have episodic high uh, lead content uh, that is ingested or inhaled, it'll be easy to detect with a blood lead level test. Um, it is not a perfect test and some of the challenges include the fact that somebody can have high body burden of lead, uh, but have uh, you know what's considered uh, normal or below the cutoff of lead levels. And the exception, as I mentioned, are physiologically stressful circumstances. Um, next slide. And so to help uh, with that, there are other tests that are available. And uh, another uh, test that is uh, that Tony had asked about was something called ZPP. So as we talk about ZPP, keep in mind that this is not a direct uh, test that measures lead levels. What this test measure, measures is the toxic effect of lead on red blood cells. So ZPP, uh, so lead interferes with uh, red blood cell production. And um, ZPP, which is synonymous with EP and FEP, so you may see uh, all of these reported, uh, basically goes up uh, in, um, as an indicator of toxic effect of lead on, lead on red blood cells. And to correlate it with blood lead levels, uh, ZPP will go up uh, in the level which is more than 35 micrograms per liter or per deciliter of blood is uh, uh, associated with blood lead levels of more than 25 micrograms per deciliter. And so this, uh, because again, this is not a direct measure of lead, but a measure of lead's toxicity on the red blood cells or heme synthesis to be more precise. Um, this is a reflection of lead exposure lead toxicity over the past four months. It is useful in distinguishing between acute and chronic lead intoxication. And it is a useful adjunct uh, to the blood, venous blood lead levels uh, to assess both prior uh, higher level of exposure in addition to current ongoing lead exposure. And it is uh, a, a mandatory part of lead exposure surveillance program. Next slide. Um, some of the uh, challenges with ZPP is that it is not sensitive uh, for lower blood lead levels. In other words, it doesn't go up until blood lead levels are 25 or reach 25 micrograms per deciliter. And so if you have a reference level cutoff of uh, blood lead levels, five micrograms per deciliter, you will have uh, a lot of false negative results if you only use uh, CPP as your measure of lead toxicity. Uh, many false negative results, I should say. 
And uh, another challenge is that uh, ZPP can be elevated in other diseases and not just blood exposure. And some of the examples include iron deficiency, uh, sickle cell anemia, liver disease, alcoholism, porphyria, and um, other examples. Another way to test for lead is using something called X-ray uh, fluorescence. And that is primarily used in research and measures uh, lead deposited in the bone. And so uh, one of the useful things uh, from the clinical perspective is that if you don't have a clear history uh, of lead exposure, but you have a suspicion, for example, uh, you can provide evidence of past lead exposure um, in the absence of uh, known uh, history of lead exposure. And um, this was one of the uh, myths uh, that Tony had mentioned to us that was circulating is that the best test for lead is a hair test. Uh, that is not actually accurate. And hair tests are not currently approved by the FDA. And some of the major reasons why uh, is that there's a significant amount of inter-laboratory variability uh, with respect to reference ranges, uh, which is cutoff limits um, of what's you know, considered quote unquote normal. Um, the results, uh, there is a variability between results, uh, interpretation and health uh, advice that is given based on these results. In other words, uh, if you go to one lab, you may get uh, very different uh, results from uh, a different lab. And Norm had uh, spoken about this. So I will just uh, briefly mention that uh, OSHA uh, sets a certain frequency uh, for blood lead level testing and uh, recommendations on removal from work, uh, removal from exposure and return to work. And it, these are minimal recommended standards uh, for workers who may be exposed to lead. Next slide. And the CDC has recommendations uh, for children who may be exposed to lead. Um, and these are, if you notice, uh, uh, the testing is more frequent, uh, starting at lower blood lead levels. Um, and again, you can review them uh, later on. I won't go into the details. And how, uh, so these are some of the other questions that came up uh, from Tony. Uh, one of the questions was, when is chelation therapy appropriate and can it ever be used prophylactically? And whether or not chelation therapy can quote unquote fix lead poisoning. So uh, chelation therapy is not trivial. It is not risk-free, but it is the standard of treatment for children with blood lead levels of uh, greater than 45 micrograms per deciliter. When you decide about treatment for uh, lead intoxication, you have to look at uh, the individual, uh, their risk factors, their comorbidities, um, and their clinical presentation. And uh, chelation has to be done under the supervision of a toxicologist. Um, there is sodium EDTA, which is a chelating agent that is not any more effective than placebo, uh, but there is a choice of other chelating agents. And again, uh, because chelation challenge uh, can increase blood lead levels, it is not recommended, it may be harmful. Um, so if chelation is necessary, again, uh, it is important to be done under the supervision of a toxicologist. Another uh, couple of questions were uh, about lead clearance and what is the health life of lead in the body, as well as another question um, of if no new lead is introduced, how many years before our bodies eliminate the lead that's already there? So these are all very important questions. Um, uh, the half-life of uh, lead in the blood is one to two months, and uh, the half-life, uh, frankly, in the skeleton is years to decades. And, uh, you know, to answer the second question, if how, how long does it take uh, before our bodies eliminate the lead, it really depends on the total body burden. Next slide. 
so this was one more interesting question that we received was uh, whether drinking milk can mitigate lead entry into the body and whether there's uh, merit to calcium levels being high uh, to help with lead exposure. So the first thing I want to mention is that uh, your calcium levels should not be elevated. Uh, it does, this can have adverse health effects. Um, but there are studies showing that calcium and phosphate, for example, in a meal can lower the absorption of ingested lead. So uh, this has to be interpreted with caution uh, because calcium supplementation, for example, can have adverse effect on coronary artery calcifications leading to heart disease and it can have adverse effects on uh, um, some other organs such as kidneys. So before you decide to take a calcium supplementation, it's very important to speak with your primary care doctor and assess, assess the risks and benefits. Next slide. So what you want to focus on is consuming food uh, that is high in calcium and phosphate and um, uh, cheese lovers can thank me later, but the highest amount of calcium per cup can be found in Swiss cheese, uh, dried sweet whey, and provolone. And the highest amount of phosphorus per cup is found in sunflower, pumpkins, and squash seeds. And uh, there's a slide towards the end of the presentation that I encourage you to take a look at later because it has a lot of, um, it has a few links that may be helpful, but also uh, a link where you can find uh, different mineral content in uh, various food groups. And, you know, instead of taking supplements, really focus on the diet um, to help you with lead absorption, to help you prevent lead absorption. Another question came up about taking uh, vitamin and herbal detox supplements and whether they can mitigate lead exposure. And uh, there is no magic pill, uh, unfortunately. Uh, you want to, the, uh, you know, as Norm and I had mentioned earlier, the less you want to reduce exposure, that's the main goal. Uh, but in experimental animal studies, um, iron, phosphate, calcium, zinc, and possibly copper have shown to reduce uh, toxicity of several metals, heavy metals we're talking about, uh, and that included lead. So again, if you want to focus on a healthy diet uh, that has all these minerals in it, uh, rather than um, herbal supplements, some of which could in fact be contaminated with lead. Um, so with this, I wanted to thank you for this wonderful opportunity, and I will pass it on to Norm. Yeah, hi. So I'm back again. Uh, I, these are a few more uh, questions that were asked um, of us. Um, washing hands at the end of, end of the day, is that enough? It's great to wash up, but you've got to what I want to emphasize, you got to use all the controls that we discuss. It's a cumulative effect. We to eliminate the exposure as much as possible because you're never going to be able to check how much you're getting exposed to and and what's mm -hmm. going on. You got to use a HEPA vacuum. You try to re reduce or eliminate disturbing activities such as grinding, using ventilation. All of these tools are what you have to do to reduce it as many as you can. Uh, different circumstances, work areas, um, act, you know, it's going to be different. So it's it really a lot of it, especially for people in the trade, based on, you know, how your work site and what your, how you, what your limitations are. Uh, low blood level means you're okay. As Dr. Gobina went over, blood lead level measures your blood, le your lead level at the time the blood was drawn. It doesn't say anything about what was happening before or what's going to happen two months from now when you're doing a different job that's got a lot of lead on it. So it, it, it's a it's tool. You just have to know what it really means. Uh, you get over lead poisoning. Well, in a sense, that's correct, because what will tell you uh, to reduce your exposure, stop or reduce or eliminate or stop working. Yeah, that's going to bring your current blood lead level down doesn't change to a 
a great extent or, or quickly the amount that's been stored in your bones that's there for uh, years or decades slowly migrates out. Um, and of course, of course, any new exposure or any job you're doing that has lead, that's going to put, put that lead level back up or potentially put it up again. Next slide, please. So keeping the studio swept clean is good hygiene. Cleaning is good, sweeping is not. You want to use a HEPA vacuum or damp mopping. Sweeping just entrains it up in, th in the air, making it possible for you to breathe it in. You don't want to sweep. No, dry, dry sweeping is a no-no. A respirator is all you need for protection. It will pro respirator will protect you if it's properly fitted, properly worn, you're wearing it all the time. Yes, it will. But you can't rely on it solely. You've got to look at all the other controls in, con in conjunction with wearing a respirator. And, and respirators have their limitations. You take the respirator off, you start, you're start. you going to be breathing uh, lead in if you're not wearing it all the time, if it's not fitted correctly. All of those can be uh, um, will reduce uh, or increase exposure and reduce its effectiveness. 